Okay. Um, so, uh, so good morning and uh, good, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, so, so here in China, uh, uh, this is Zhang Hu again from Wuhan University in China, and we are in the in the evening now at nine o'clock. Uh, so, I hope you are enjoying this. Uh, you're going to enjoy this uh, training course for the introduction of the precise point positioning software and how to use it for geophysics studies. So I'd like to uh, have introduction of myself, just uh, some brief words. So um, I'm, a, I'm a professor at Wuhan University studying uh, GNSS geodesy. So, so we, we do develop some advanced uh, high, high precision GNSS algorithm and software to, um, to do some geodetic uh, work like the maintenance of the reference frame as well as some uh, positioning and the navigation applications like the uh, driverless vehicles. So this is the, the current current task, what we are doing um, uh, in, in Wuhan University. So today we have two speakers. Another speaker is my PhD student, uh, Ji Hang Ling. Uh, hi, Ji Hang, could you show yourself on the screen? And uh, you can just uh, have a few words to introduce yourself. Mm. Hello, everyone. I'm here. I'm Ji Hang Ling, a uh, student in what? Wuhan University GNSS Center, and now in charge of the maintenance and the developing of the PPPAR software. And got very honored to have this chance to deliver this course to you. Okay, thank you, Jihang. Very good. Um, so, so, uh, uh, so, thank you, uh, thank everyone for for being here today to. Uh, um, to have this, uh, to have this, uh, to have this course, uh, and uh, I, I also thank uh, the uh, Earthscope uh, for making this uh, course uh, happen, and uh, we hope we can have a uh, have a good have a uh, have a good time to to share the knowledge together. So I would like to first to have introduce uh, have an introduction the of the schedule and the guide and the guidance of the of the course. Um, all right, so this is the schedule for two days. And today uh, on September 25th, so we're going to have two parts for, for, the, for the first day. And the first one is the, some, some introduction, some basic knowledge of the high precision GNSS, uh, especially on its uh, constellation uh, characteristics and error budgets within the GNSS observations. I know some of, uh, some of, most of you guys have the basic knowledge of GNSS but some of them may not have uh, so much knowledge on how the GNSS works and how we can uh, make the uh, make the high precision positioning uh, um, implemented in all kinds of software. And maybe they have they, they need to know something uh, something basic to the GNSS data. So after that, we th uh, this part will last for about one uh, one hour, and after that, we're going to have a break for about ten minutes. And the second one is going to have a uh, to have a uh, the basic introduction of the software uh, structure and some basic operation to just have the atmosphere to warm up. So uh, this will last for about one and a half hour, and finally we will have about uh, ten to ten minutes to have uh, questions and answers to on on uh, what kind how we can um, uh, operate operate this software and what kind of and uh, whether you have to see whether you have any uh, questions on the uh, on GNSS, right? This, for the second day, on the just in in two days on September twenty seventh, we're going to have uh, have uh, some more introduction on the uh, on the international GNSS service, which is uh, the foundation for this uh, software. So we we're going to have uh, some support from the IGS uh, products and the data. And then we'll have a break and we're going to have some advanced um, uh, training on how to use the Pride PVR software to do uh, all kinds of uh, processing that you may encounter in your, in your research. For example, to have some kinematic processing, some uh, kinematic processing over a few uh, short, of the short terms for, uh, for example, every five minutes or every half an hour to have a position estimate, uh, just something like this. And finally, we have the uh, questions and answers as well. So after the first day of, uh, of course, we're going to have some assignments to have the participants to uh, 
uh, make themselves familiar with how to use the software. And uh, on the second day of the course, we're going to have the uh, have some have the results to be released to the uh, to the uh, to the participants on uh, on on how they can finish the uh, assignments of uh, of this course. All right. Uh, so I have a lot of the admission here. All right. Okay. So this is the preparation. So I uh, I should I should send you this uh, preparation at first, but uh, but here this is not too late for you to to have a look at the uh, where you can find the software uh, from the GitHub homepage. Uh, this uh, from here uh, you can download the software uh, to uh, uh, to see how it can be installed. And we have the uh, manual to be attached to this software as well. So this is an updated version, and you can see how uh, how to use it uh, and how and uh, in different scenarios how you can process data and how you make the settings of the software. Um, so um, and the final part is most important. Uh, we have the we have some we have developed some video demos to to demonstrate how you can uh, make an inst installation step by step. So this is just a recording of the of the of the install uh, of the installation steps. So you can see how uh, just follow follow the follow the operation. Uh, all right, okay. So follow the operation uh, from the demo from from the video demos. So that can make things easier if you cannot follow um, the uh, the teaching at this uh, training class. All right. So before you have your installation of this software, so just make sure you have the software to be have the uh, supporting software to be installed in your uh, in your machine. Uh, for example, the WGET software, the Make software, the GFortune compiler, uh, because all of the uh, most of the software uh, is written in the in the Fortune ninety five language, uh, and then you have the Py Python three software to be installed to to plot some of the results uh, in the uh, in visuals. Okay, so this is uh, just some kind of um, uh, the uh, the schedule for the training class, and you can. No, oh, sorry. All right. So then we come to. Um... Okay, before we uh, before we start to talk about the software, uh, talk about how we can do precise point positioning. Uh, based on multi-genesis data, uh, we'd like to have a brief introduction on the data itself, so and and as well as the uh, infrastructure, the GNSS constellation, uh, to see how we can uh, utilize this uh, uh, constellation to to do precise positioning on a global scale. So where shall we start? The first one is the uh, the full name of the GNSS, which is uh, the Global Navigation Satellite System. So now we have four constellations from uh, the first one, the GPS and the, uh, and the GLONASS, Galileo and the BDS system. And we have two additional regional system. So all of these constellation, they are continuous and they have a global coverage capability. They are precise. Uh, if you think one meter, uh, uh, one meter position accuracy, uh, precision is, is precise enough. So they can do a surveying everywhere and at any time without any problem without any uh, uh, any any um, uh, uh, blockage of the day of the, of the signal by the by, the, uh, by all kind uh, by all kinds of uh, uh, weather conditions uh, and nowadays we can uh, the high precision GNSS, I mean we can use GNSS to to achieve the centimeter level to even millimeter level precisions so this kind of high precision GNSS can be applied to a variety of uh, fields. For example, uh, the basic application is a geodetic application, which is more related to the maintenance of the establishment and the maintenance of the reference frame, which is uh, the most fundamental uh, support for the uh, global geophysical studies. And uh, we can also use the uh, signals from GNSS to detect the abnormality of the atmosphere conditions. And uh, we can do some research on the space, um, uh, space weather uh, which is uh, closely related to the ionosphere, and we, and we can also use the uh, GNSS displacements um, uh, captured by the ground stations to 
invert for the hydrology uh, issue on the ground and uh, to uh, invert for the mass redistribution caused by the under, uh, underground water. So this is the, um, uh, the application we can imagine, uh, which are uh, closely related to GNSS, high precision GNSS. So now we have uh, uh, four, uh, mul uh, four uh, internet, uh, global constellations, and we normally call it multi-GNSS. Uh, this multi-GNSS means the, uh, the uh, uh, aggregation of the four uh, global constellations. So then we have uh, about 100 plus GNSS satellites in the space, they are operational, and the 40 plots can be tracked uh, simultaneous at a single epic in the open sky. So 40 satellites at a single epic means we have uh, a lot of redundancy in the data processing, and that may uh, make our positioning to be more reliable than, than GPS owning solutions. So we're going to make a comparison between the GPS owning solution and the multi genesis solution later uh, using the software. And this is the uh, signal composition from the uh, modern uh, modernized GNSS. So we call normally we call it uh, the multi-frequency observations um, from different uh, constellations. And uh, uh, this is the this is actually shows the uh, signal uh, signal structures from the four constellations. So you can see they share some frequency bands, but basically they have the L1 and the L2 bands, the lower L band and the upper L band. So these two bands are very crowded, and we can see um, uh, some. There are some signals such as uh, E1, L1, and B and B1C. Uh, they are interoperable because they overlap the same frequency band, and they have exactly the same frequencies. So this can facilitate some processing. For example, uh, we can use some uh, some receivers to uh, to receive the uh, receive the signals, uh, receive the data from uh, from GPS Galileo. And the BDS without any uh, upgrade of the antenna and any anything like the uh, the internal uh, correlator of the receiver, and then we can uh, increase, but but we can still increase the reliability of the positioning. And this can be also uh, can also be used for high precision GNSS, uh, uh, which can uh, use uh, the benefits caused by this kind of uh, by this kind of increase of the of the frequencies. Uh, so let's first uh, first go to the GPS constellation. Um, so we have uh, just have some some basic uh, some basic uh, brief introduction of the GPS constellation and the GPS history. Uh, so the GPS constellation was uh, was uh, first established in the in the in the nineteen eighties in the last century. Uh, so now it has um, uh, so each generation of satellites have uh, much more advanced capabilities than the previous generation. Uh, for example, now we have the block to R uh, satellites, six block to R satellites, and seven block to uh, block, block to RM, and the 12 block to F, and the six block uh, GPS block three satellites. So the block three satellites uh, are the most advanced satellite generations, and it has four civil signals, uh, including the, uh, the LAC CCA code, and as well as the L2, L5, and L1C, code, L1C signals. So these civil signals can enhance the capability of GPS as the foundation of the global uh, positioning providers and can ensure the highest, uh, highest reliability of positioning. And now we have about 10 satellites uh, 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 operational, uh, 10 satellites will be launched to the space before 2026. Um, and this is the constellation composition of the GPS uh, GPS satellites. So now we have a uh, 31 satellites. Normally, it, ha it should have 32 satellites to be in the in the space. Sometimes they have some spare satellites. Sometimes they uh, maybe a few of them maybe maybe uh, may malfunction. So uh, so they'll be down uh, from time to time. And now it has a uh, number uh, has six orbital planes. And which have uh, with an inclination angle of fifty five degrees, so you can see the satellites just uh, so relative uh, relative to the Earth, the sat uh, GPS satellites just fly, uh, just fly from the east, uh, from the west north at an inclination angle of fifty five degrees. So this can cause something, uh, which uh, we are going to talk about later, to cause some correlation of the east component of your positions with the. With the uh, with some parameters in the care phase observations, and after some special processing, we can 
uh, decrease this correlation and to improve the position precision. So it has a, it has a uh, altitude of about twelve uh, about twenty thousand kilometers, and this is actually the common uh, altitude among the four constellations. So you will see uh, the four constellations have very similar altitude uh, uh, towards the Earth. So these are the uh, are the characteristic uh, signals are released by the GPS constellation, for example, L two C, uh, which was uh, which was emitted by the uh, by the Block two R M satellites and the followers, and then we have the L five satellites, which is the first uh, third uh, third uh, frequency signal, the civil frequency uh, by the GPS constellation, and has a uh, has a great capability to. Uh, to resist multi-path effects and have more have higher reliability compared to uh, alto signals, and then we have the for the latest generation of the uh, of the of the GPS satellites that is block block three, and we have the L one C signal which is uh, comparable to the L two C signal, but uh, but um, modulated on the L one frequency band. Um, now we have the bonus uh, constellation, uh, which is very special, and uh, it's uh, it, it was first um, established as a as a uh, as uh, for for each satellite to have different have different frequencies. And now um, some new generation satellites uh, for GLONASS K and the GLONASS K two they have the uh, same frequencies for each satellite, but the number of this kind of GLONASS K satellites is very few. Uh, so here we have a. Uh, detailed introduction on the um, on the uh, on the spa, uh, on the uh, uniqueness of the GLONASS constellation, the uh, frequency division multiple access signals. So in in this case, uh, whenever you have an epic of data from the GLONASS constellation, uh, the signals from different satellites have different frequencies. So this can uh, this may not be a big problem for uh, for the for the for the for some kind of uh, low 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 precision positioning based on some pseudo range data, but it can be a big problem for the carrier phase uh, uh, processing because uh, the ambiguity from ambiguity parameters from the from different satellites uh, do not have the same uh, wavelength. So uh, some RTK and uh, ambiguity resolution capability cannot be enabled in this case. So that's why a new generation uh, GLONASS K satellites. Uh, were launched in the past few years, but their number uh, is not so many. Uh, but we can see what can happen in the future, whether this uh, kind of GLONASS-K satellite can populate the GLONASS constellation. Okay, so then we come to the uh, Galileo constellation, which, uh, which was um, established by the European Union. So uh, from my opinion, this is the most advanced constellation compared to the other three uh, constellations, even compared to GPS, so we can see the signals from Galileo constellation is um, uh, is more precise than the signals from the other constellations. So the first uh, Galileo satellites were were were, uh, were launched in the year of 20, uh, 2005, and that's a, uh, that uh, that uh, that were uh, those were the GOV A and the GOV satellites. Uh, now we uh, we have two kind of Galileo satellites in the space. The first type is the in-orbit validation satellite, of which we have only two. Uh, they are they were uh, they are operational since the year. They have been operational since the year of 2011, and uh, for the for the uh, for the remaining satellites, they are all uh, fully operational capability satellites. Uh, they are uh, they were launched since the year of uh, 2016. So now we have a. Uh, the four constellation of Galileo is uh, uh, should be uh, composed of thirty satellites, but now we have only twenty three uh, in the orbit. Uh, so um, and the two, two 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 additional satellites will be launched in the year of twenty four twenty four. Um, but we can still use the uh, incomplete uh, Galileo constellation to do something uh, something great. All right, this is the uh, constellation composition of the uh, Galileo system. So it has four uh, IOV satellites and 24 uh, FOC satellites. Uh, the inclination angle for the orbital plane is quite similar to GPS. So it's uh, 56 degrees and it has uh, 
has a little bit higher altitude compared to GPS. So it's 23,000 kilometers, uh, which is about 3,000 kilometers higher than the uh, GPS orbital planes. All right, this is the, uh, the signal composition of the Galileo constellation. Uh, so it has E1 on the L1 band, which is uh, completely compatible with the GPS L1 and the BDS B1C signals. So these three kinds of signals are fully uh, interoperable and uh, some common uh, receivers can receive these three signals without any problem, without any upgrade of the firmware, uh, of the hardware. The firmware may, may, be, uh, may need to be upgraded, but the hardware can, uh, can, can stay the same and can still uh, benefit from the three constellations with interoperable signals like E1, L1, and uh, B1C. And E5A and E5B are the specialties, uh, are the unique uh, signals uh, designed for Galileo constellation. So uh, these two signals can be combined to have a great uh, capability to resist the uh, multipath effects. So it can uh, have a have a higher uh, higher uh, have a higher precision compared to uh, compared to E1. And E6 signal is some kind of like uh, authorized signal. Uh, so it's for commercial application for the highest reliability, and the E6 signals can be uh, used for uh, in combination with the E1 and the E5A to have uh, some uh, high efficiency in the processing in the real time processing of uh, carrier phase data. Uh, so now uh, I'd like to uh, make some special points on the Galileo clocks on uh, satellite onboard clocks. So uh, the each Galileo satellite is equipped with uh, two hydrogen and two rubidium atomic clocks. Uh, this uh, so from the right right panels four panels you can see the comparison of the uh, of the Allen deviations for the for the onboard clocks from the uh, for the four um, uh, GNSS constellations. So you see uh, that the Galileo satellites the, uh, which are uh, plotted in the in the bottom bottom left panel. So you see their uh, Allen deviations uh, are, are much smaller compared to the other three. So which means their clock precision, the clock stability over the long term is much better than, uh, than the other three constellations clocks. So this will make uh, the Galileo um, uh, uh, real-time positioning more stable, especially when you want to uh, predict the clock uh, corrections from the Galileo satellites. So then, uh, you can have more um, uh, uh, significant performance uh, in real-time positioning. So now we come to uh, the BDS um, uh, BDS system, BDS constellation. Uh, this, uh, uh, so the Beidou system uh, has uh, three stages for the development. The first generation of BDS uh, constellation uh, was uh, was established in the year of 2000. So it consisted of only three geo satellites, the geosynchronous of the orbiter satellites. So that means uh, the, 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 uh, there was no uh, geometry change for the constellation and that you can only determine the horizontal, comp uh, horizontal uh, coordinates of your position uh, within China. And this is actual demonstration system uh, based on some uh, so it's not a passive positioning system. Uh, you have to send the signals to the geo satellite before you can have your position to be computed. So just to demonstrate the uh, capability of the satellite uh, infrastructure, uh, which is uh, which is going to be upgraded to BDS two, um, whether uh, whether we can uh, use the uh, to properly properly use properly receive the signals from a satellite in space. Then the second generation, the BDS two, is the regional system, and the, now it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a passive system to, uh, which is quite which is similar to GPS constellation. So the users need uh, uh, only use use some use the BDS receiver to have the signals to demodulate it from the uh, from the satellites, and uh, they can have the pseudo range and the carrier phase as well. Uh, you you can uh, calculate your position uh, just uh, following the the same strategy of the GPS and the Galileo. So this system was established in the year of 2012, and it has uh, five geosatellites, five IGSO satellites, the inclined geosynchronous satellite orbit orbiters, and four MEO satellites. So that, uh, that means 
uh, this constellation is only for regional positioning, and uh, uh, it's uh, it's some it can be taken as some inter intermediate system uh, between BDS one and the BDS three. So for the BDS three system, it's a global system which is um, which is more close to the GPS and the Galileo. So it has about thirty satellites in the space. Uh, which is composed of three geo satellites and three IGSO satellites and 24 MEO satellites to uh, to fly around the globe. And you can see at least four satellites at any corner of the globe. And uh, this was established in the year of 2020. All right. Um, so now we still have the BDS2 and the BDS3 constellation to be uh, observable and in the space. But the BDS2 constellation is uh, going to be down, and uh, we are we are going to have so the Chinese government is not going to maintain the BDS2 constellation anymore, and the BDS3 uh, BDS3 constellation is uh, is going to be the only uh, global constellation to be supported by the Chinese government. Um, for the BDS2, uh, for these two uh, constellations, we have some special satellites, uh, navigation satellites, uh, to be launched. The first one is geostationary Earth orbit, Earth orbiters. So this kind of satellite is not seen uh, from the other three global constellations. So they have only MEO satellites, but the Beidou have the geo satellites. So this kind of geo satellites can provide some uh, space-based augmentation, um, uh, augmentation corrections. So they can be combined with the uh, the navigation satellite system. And the second one is the inclined geosynchronous orbiters, the IGSO satellites. So this kind of satellites have the same altitude with, uh, uh, with uh, as the as those of the geo satellites, but it can uh, move uh, relative to the ground, and uh, it can just roll just um, just hover over the Chinese region. So this can increase uh, can improve the coverage rates of the satellites over the Asia Pacific region. So uh, and uh, because of the uh, you can you can use only the regional ground stations to monitor the health conditions of these satellites. Okay, this is the, uh, the ground tracks of the of the BDS2 and the BDS3 constellations. So we can see in the Asian Pacific area from the from China, Japan to the southern part of Australia and the Southeast Asia. So we can see uh, more satellites and uh, more ground tracks from the BDS satellites. So this is because the BDS2 constellations still work. Uh, still works and it can have uh, can increase the density of the ground tracks of the satellites in the Asian in the Asian Pacific region. So now we have about forty seven BDS satellites in the space, and which is um, the largest number of satellite of navigation satellites uh, compared to the other uh, the other three constellations. All right, so this is the um, the signal structure of the BDS, uh, BDS uh, constellations, because we have two generations of constellation to be uh, uh, to be operational in the space, so the signal structure is more complicated. The BDS two has BDS, B, B, has three frequency bands uh, for the B one I, B two I, and B three I, and uh, when we come to the BDS three constellation to maintain the interoperability with the GPS L one and the Galileo E one. The BDS3 constellation designed a new signal, B1C signal. Uh, B1C, the C means uh, collab uh, collaborative or cooperational, which means um, B1C is fully compatible with the GPS R1 and the Galileo E1, uh, which can improve some civilian application in terms of positioning precisions and the reliabilities. Then the BDS3, BDS B1, B2A, and the B2B signals are, uh, are quite similar to the Galileo E1, uh, E5A, and the E5B signals. So they can be combined together to have the largest resistance to multipath effects and to improve the uh, positioning reliability and precision compared to BDS, uh, B, uh, BDS3, B1C, and B, uh, and some, some other signals from the BDS2 satellites. Oh, then after the introduction of the four constellations, we have spent a lot of time. So we wanted to go to some more details of the of the common background of the GNSS. So the first part is the the pseudo range observations, uh, the observation types are provided by GNSS. The first type is the some cool uh, observations like the pseudo range. So this is uh, this is some this is um, an observation type uh, which uh, 
and which can support absolute positioning uh, at any corner around the globe. And this is a standard service provided by, uh, by GNSS. Uh, the pseudo range is actually the distance measured by the receiver uh, from, uh, for, from the receiver to the satellite. It is called pseudo range because uh, the, uh, the satellite clock and the receiver clock errors are also included in this kind of, uh, in this kind of observations. So, so we have to, whenever we want to process the data, process the pseudo range data, we have to take the, uh, the clock error into account. And these clock errors are uh, absorbed into this observation types because um, of the, in, within, the, within the receiver uh, uh, tracking loop, the, 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 the replica signals produced by the receivers and uh, the received signals from the satellites are correlated by, are correlated by uh, uh, using using the uh, using the using the signal structures as shown in the in the bottom bottom right panel. So in this case, the the uh, the clock errors migrated into the uh, into the correlation process, and that can cause some cause errors in the in the in the range in the range observations. So that's why we call it pseudo range. Uh, the pseudo range is uh, with the pseudo range data, we can easily understand how the GNSS do the positioning positioning task. Uh, the standard point positioning uses the uh, the pseudo range data, and uh, we uh, we we got our position based on the tri triangulation. So we needed to have the distance measurement from our receiver to the four satellites, at least the four satellites, and then we have the distance measurement. So we can do the triangulation. Uh, in the space and the intersection point is actually our position on the ground. And uh, act in theory, we need only three satellites to do this um, uh, coordinate calculation because this is a 3D a three dimensional uh, world. But the fourth satellite is needed because we needed to determine the uh, receiver clock error as we have mentioned in previous slides. Uh, we need the fourth, clock, fourth satellite to uh, compute the receiver clock errors. Um, so this is the description for the performance of uh, of a standard point positioning uh, based on the pseudo range data. And uh, we can see here, uh, normally uh, in the horizontal plane, we can achieve about one or two meter uh, precision on the global scale. And in the vertical, it should be three to five times worse than the, than the horizontal plane. Uh, this is because the pseudo range data has a large noise compared to the carry phase observations. Uh, it has a noise at about uh, one meter to three meters normally, and uh, we so in this case we normally we don't have precise models to uh, correct for the top sphere delay, the relativity effects, as well as the orbit, orbital uh, orbital errors. So because that that kind of no matter uh, even if you have precise models the uh, the high the not the high noise of pseudo range data uh, will uh, will make this kind of correction um, um, useless. All right. So so if we wanted to have a high precision uh, positions to be calculated using the GNSS data, we have to go to the carrier phase data. Uh, so before we we have uh, some brief introduction of the carrier phase data, we want to talk about the position the most that. Uh, that is based on the carry phase data. The first one is the relative positioning or the differential positioning. We normally call it RTK, the real-time climatic positioning. So we need one uh, base station to, uh, to transmit the correction data to the rover stations. Because of the correlation of the errors uh, among orbits, uh, cl uh, clocks, as well as atmosphere refraction, so we can use the nearby base station to, to have the correction data to be calculated precisely, and the rover station can benefit from this correction data to improve its own position precision. Um, this is the typical, uh, a typical RTK network uh, in the US. Maybe this is not the latest one, but you can see uh, we need to establish a lot of uh, tracking stations on the ground to support this kind of uh, RTK capability. This is because the correlation of the uh, correlation between the errors uh, of the errors between the uh, between the rover stations and the base stations uh, will be uh, decreased when the when their distance is in uh, is increased. 
So then we have to uh, maintain a dense network. So the favorable uh, interstation distance is smaller than uh, 100 kilometers. Uh, should be, uh, if it's smaller than 50 kilometers, that will make things much better, especially uh, in the case of some ionosphere um, turbulence. So then uh, that will affect the correlation of the errors between the stations. Right, so, uh, but now uh, today we're going to have some more uh, uh, use the precise uh, point positioning capability to process our data. So as you know from previous slides, the, the RTK high precision uh, positioning uh, is based on at least two stations. So you have to pre-establish the reference station before you can do any centimeter level and a millimeter level positioning. Uh, so this is not, e not easy uh, for, for some common users. They just want to use one, one station to have the processing to be finished and to have the comparable position precision to RTK. So then we come to the undifferenced positioning. We don't need to do any uh, differencing between the observations from the two stations. So we call it precise point positioning or PPP. And, uh, and in this case, we, uh, we needed to rely on some precise uh, corrections like the satellite warbits and the plaques uh, which are normally provided by the IGS, by the International Genetic Service. So we are going to talk about this uh, IGS uh, in our, on, on, on Wednesday. And uh, uh, in, in the RTK positioning, uh, this kind of precise cellular will be in the cloud products are not necessary. But here uh, we need them uh, as a prerequisite before we can do a centimeter level and a millimeter level position. So this is a typical, uh, typical comparison between the PPP and RTK uh, uh, positioning modes. So you can see uh, the RTK's performance is, uh, is uh, deteriorated uh, when never the interstation distance is increased. But based on PPP technique, we can maintain a very steady uh, positioning performance in terms of precision, uh, no matter uh, how far away your uh, PPP station uh, is from the uh, is from the uh, from the uh, uh, surrounding uh, reference stations, which are used to calculate the precise wall base and clocks. So this is the uh, the biggest advantage of uh, the PPP compared to RTK. All right. So uh, after that, we'd like to uh, come back to the second uh, observations that we are using for precise high precision genetics. Uh, so that is the care phase observation. Uh, you can also take the care phase observation as some kind of distance, uh, distance measurement between the satellites and, uh, and the receiver. But the problem is uh, there is unknown parameter, which is called ambiguity. So this ambiguity is, uh, is defined as the number of full, cycle, full carrier cycles uh, between the satellite and the receiver. And because of the wavelength of this full cycle is quite short, which is normally 20 centimeters for uh, for care phase uh, observations. So actually, uh, and because of the distance, uh, uh, the altitude of the satellite is about 20,000 kilometers. So there are many, many cycles between the satellites and the receivers. So, and then you have no way to count them one by one. And uh, you have to make this unknown ambiguity parameters or the unknown uh, not integer number of the full cycles between the satellite and the receiver to be, to be an unknown, to be estimated in the in your list of squares. Uh, so this will uh, pose a big threat to your processing whenever you determine the uh, ambiguity parameters uh, to an to a incorrect number, then your uh, solution will be biased and uh, you cannot achieve the uh, centimeter level positioning or not to mention the millimeter level. So this is the, uh, the biggest challenge that we needed to understand before we talk about uh, the ambiguity resolution capability of precise point positioning. Um, uh, apart from the uh, ambiguity parameters within the, uh, the, uh, within the care phase data, uh, in, in precise point positioning, we need to uh, make a note here on uh, the code and phase biases. Uh, in, in RTK, in RTK technique, we never know, we never needed to understand the, uh, the, 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 the characteristics of the biases within your hardware, uh, no matter whether it's from the satellites or the receivers, but in precise, because we can use the uh, double difference technique to 
eliminate those biases without any problem, and then the and then the integer nature of the ambiguity parameters can be recovered. So we can fully recover the uh, integer number of the full cycles within uh, between the uh, within the distance between the satellite and the receivers. But here, uh, because we 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 don't have a base station around, and we can use only uh, undifferenced observations, those uh, code and phase biases originating in the transmitter in the satellites and the receivers uh, will be mixed with your integer ambiguity parameters. So then you have no way to separate them, and you have to take them as a whole and to make them to be estimated as a whole in your list of squares. So this will cause your uh, ambiguity parameters in PVP to be uh, to be a real value the number rather than an integer number. So then you cannot uh, fix them to integers if you don't correct for this code and phase biases. Okay, this is uh, some kind of uh, some kind of knowledge, maybe harder to understand if you don't have any basics of the GNSS knowledge. Uh, so the one lane and narrow lane. Uh, normally, we uh, whenever we want to resolve the ambiguity, we we can uh, we can form some some longer wavelength uh, observation using the L1 and L2 data. So, for example, the wide lane observations have a wavelength about eighty six centimeters. So this can facilitate us to resolve the ambiguity uh, as efficiently as possible. And uh, then after the wider wide lane uh, ambiguity resolution, we can have the narrow lane to uh, narrow lane ambiguities to resolve, to recover the raw ambiguity on the uh, L1 and L2 observations. So uh, so after, so in the, in the PVP ambiguity resolution, we have to, uh, make the phase bias corrections at first before we can recover the integer properties of the undifferenced ambiguities. So we're going to talk about this later on in our uh, in our introduction of the software. Uh, so we have a uh, we have two methods for uh, for the uh, uh, for the re uh, for the, for the integer uh, in integer cycle resolution of the ambiguities. Uh, uh, the first one is the is just some integer rounding, uh, which is not shown here, and we uh, in 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 some in some real time and kinematic positioning uh, uh, tasks, uh, we uh, we normally use the least squares ambiguity decorrelation uh, adjustment method, which is called the lambda method, to to search for the integer candidates for the for the ambiguities. So this is the most efficient way to search for the ambiguity, and after we use some validation uh, approach to uh, to confirm these uh, integer candidates are correct, we can fix them directly to those integers to have improved precision and precision. So then, uh, so what's the reason uh, for uh, for fixing the ambiguities to integers? Uh, this is actually a very hard step and uh, can make something incorrect. And you have to uh, struggle to decide to whether you're fixing your ambiguity resolution stat um, is correct or not. Uh, so this figure shows the reason why we needed to fix the ambiguities. So from the bottom left, uh, from the bottom left panel, you can see uh, this is a diagonal, uh, diagonal comparison of the flow solution uh, with, uh, without fixing ambiguities. Uh, to uh, compare to the fixed solution with the ambiguities to be resolved to the in, uh, to the integers. Uh, so you can see for the ace components after we fix the ambiguities, we can improve the precision uh, for the ace components by thirty to fifty percent, and this is a great progress and great improvement. Uh, if we want to, uh, if we would like would like a high precision positioning performance to be uh, to be guaranteed. All right. So then, after the basic introduction of the position the most, we wanted to uh, come. Uh, finally, we come to the part for uh, for the um, for the error error budgets within the Genesis management. Uh, this error budget is quite important because whenever you use the you use our software to do uh, processing, you needed to understand how to how to make the settings for, uh, for example, for the troposphere delay for the atmosphere. Elimination, higher, higher, uh, the higher order atmosphere delays. How to make mitigation to this kind of errors, and how to choose the uh, 
uh, uh, the, the tidal, uh, the solid earth tides, whether you need to make some corrections on the ocean tidal loading effects. Uh, so we'd like to uh, introduce the area budgets of the genesis management uh, from, uh, uh, from three, uh, three aspects. Uh, the first one is from the solid and uh, satellites, and the second one is from the propagation path, and the final one is from the specific ends. So we divided all layers into three uh, categories to see how they can affect your positioning performance. Um, so these errors should be el uh, should be eliminated from our uh, positioning uh, positioning jobs, and we have different ways to make this mitigation. Some sometimes we can do uh, develop some precise models to make that corrections, and. Uh, and sometimes we can just stay them, just just uh, we can we can we can just keep them in the in the list of squares and estimate them as uh, unknown to uh, uh, to mitigate their impact on your positioning. So the first part is the errors from the satellites. So uh, so our first impression is the warbit error and the clock error on board of the satellites. Uh, the warb uh. Uh, take the GPS for example. You can see the GPS satellite orbit has an error of about one centimeter nowadays, and the clock error uh, is comparable to the orbit, which is about one centimeter as well. So these two kind of corrections can be provided by the IGS. You can just grab them from the IGS repos uh, repository to uh, to fix them uh, to fix them in your processing, and then uh, you can you can enable the precise point positioning. Uh, the following errors are related to the cell and antennas. For example, the cell antenna phase offset and phase center variations, and these are based on the uh, based on some uh, some ground calibrations for the satellites before they are launched to the space. And sometimes you have to you don't have this uh, ground calibration data for the phase center offset and phase center variations. Then you have to uh, make an estimation of these errors using a global network uh, to so this is the normal case for GPS, but for Galileo satellites, you have the manufacturer, manufacturer provided, uh, provided the corrections. Uh, these corrections are more related to the satellite attitude. So uh, if you don't have a precise model for the satellite attitudes, then your um, satellite antenna offset and the variation corrections may be wrong as well. And then we have the code code bias and the phase bias, which can also be uh, can also be uh, be provided by the uh, by the IGS. Uh, the satellite orbits. Uh, this is the uh, the uh, temporal evolution of the GPS satellite orbit precision. Uh, this is a comparison uh, between uh, between the orbit product from different analysis. So you can see the orbit precision converge over the past uh, past two decades. And now we have the precision at the level of a few centimeters. Uh, this is the uh, this is also the case for the Galileo orbit errors, and the BDS orbit errors is a little bit worse compared to uh, GPS and the Galileo. Great. So this is the seven o'clock. Uh, in the broadcast ephemeris released by the uh, by the GPS satellite GPS satellites themselves, uh, the 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 clock uh, the seven o'clock uh, error can be up to. Uh, several nanoseconds, uh, which can equate to a few meters. And uh, normally we use a second order, so you look at this uh, equation here, a second order polynomial to fit the uh, clock error of the satellites. Uh, this can uh, cause some errors uh, because the cellular clock behavior does not follow exactly the uh, second order polynomial, but uh, uh, if you want to do some real-time processing, you have to use some uh, some some simple uh, model to describe the behavior of the clock. Uh, in the case of a precise point positioning, we use um, tabulated corrections of the clock, uh, which is provided by the IGS. So why uh, why do I call them the tabulated? Because we provide them to clock corrections using uh, uh, every five or every thirty seconds or every five minutes. Uh, that's just epic by epic for each satellite. So we are not going to use the second order polynomial to describe the behavior of the solar clocks, but just tabulate them and the users need to interpolate the uh, tabulated values to get the correction of the, the clocks. 
at the at the target at the target apex. But in this case, you have to uh, take the interpolation error into account because, for example, in the bottom right bottom right panel, you see uh, for the five minutes clock. If you do the interpolation, you will have the interpolation error to be uh, incorporated into your processing if you are going to process one second data. But if you use the 10 second clock, uh, your interpolation error can be decreased a lot and your uh, hybrid processing for this one second data processing uh, may, may be uh, negligibly affected by this kind of interpolation error. All right, this is the cellular antenna fit center and uh, cellular attitude error. Um, as I've told, this, uh, these two kinds of errors are correlated. Uh, if you wanted to precisely make a precisely correct for the antenna phase center errors, you have to uh, think about, you have to uh, have a precise description of the satellite attitudes to be, uh, to be released as a unique product. Uh, for example, on the bottom, bottom right corner, we have the, we have the uh, panel showing the uh, comparison between the uh, attitude corrections, uh, uh, the cell, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the care phase and the pseudo range residuals uh, with, uh, with and without uh, precise cell attitude corrections. So the green color shows that if we have precise cell corrections, uh, we can have the, uh, can have the care phase residuals to be as small as possible, uh, even at some low uh, elevation angles. So this can, uh, can uh, improve the position and performance. All right, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, and uh, we just want to leave some more time for the introduction of the software. So this shows the second part of the errors, error budgets within the genesis data, which is related to the, related to the propagation path. Um, the two typical one, uh, two typical uh, atmosphere related errors are troposphere delay and atmosphere delay. The troposphere delay are divided into two parts. The first one is dry dry part, uh, which can be modeled precisely to the level of few, few millimeters. And the, the wet part of the troposphere delay uh, can be uh, mitigated using some models, uh, uh, but, but that mitigation performance is not so, so good. So you have to take them, uh, take, the, take, the, take the wet part, wet component of the troposphere as an unknown parameter in your, in your list of squares. So that can make the mitigation uh, better and to improve the position precision in your vertical components. So we have to make a, make a note here, the top sphere delay estimation is, uh, is closely related to your vertical component. So whenever you wanted to, uh, uh, well, to calculate your top sphere delay, uh, or, your, or your goal is to, uh, to make the top sphere product, you have to uh, fix the coordinates of your stations. Uh, otherwise, your uh, your uh, your vertical uh, component uh, will be highly cor correlated with your um, uh, troposphere delay estimates. For the uh, for the atmosphere delay uh, uh, in in the PVP processing, we normally use the uh, the linear combination of the L1 and L2 signals to have the first order of atmosphere delays to be eliminated. Um, but but we still have some higher order atmosphere delay. Um, uh, to be to be to be kept in your in the in the observations. So then we can use some uh, global atmosphere map to have this uh, error to be compensated. But but this kind of error is quite small. If you want to improve your uh, global reference frame precision, you can think about it. But but but, but uh, most of the time you don't need to take this into account. Okay, so uh, this is the uh, troposphere delay. So we used uh, we we have two parts: the wet part and the, and the, and the dry part. And uh, this is the 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 right red panel shows the comparison with and without uh, the mitigation of the troposphere delay. So the red color shows the vertical uh, positioning precision. So you can see in the top in the top right panel we don't have any troposphere correction. And you can see the vertical component has a large fluctuation over the 24 hours, which can account to, which can be up to, to 12, 12 centimeters. But after we have the uh, correction of the top sphere delays, uh, which is shown in the bottom, bottom, right, bottom right panel, so we can see the vertical component, the red color, uh, has been, been stabilized and uh, 
at a reasonable level and the fluctuation is not so, uh, so systematic. Okay, this is the uh, this is the description for the mapping function. Uh, because we uh, in in the trapeze modeling, we normally uh, use the mapping function to have the vertical uh, trapeze delay to be projected onto the slant path. So in this way, we can use only one parameter, uh, one trapeze parameter to be estimated and to represent the uh, to represent the overall. Uh, troposphere conditions around that station that can facilitate the processing. Although this uh, description is not so uh, so precise, but that's, uh, that's uh, some kind of trade-off between the uh, facilitation of the parameter processing and the and the real condition of the troposphere conditions around the uh, around the station. So uh, normally we use we provide three kind of uh, mapping functions in the software. The first one is NMF, which is quite quite laxy. And the second one is GMF, which is uh, quite easy to be used, and uh, and it is actually the prevalent model, uh, prevalent mapping function to be used by common users. Uh, the third one is the VMF, uh, VMF one and the VMF three, uh, and these two kind of mapping functions are quite complicated. You have to download some additional products from a uh, that's in the website uh, to have this. Uh, this is a tabulated mapping function data as well. And uh, you can do some interpolation uh, over this uh, tabulated mapping function to have the uh, have the have the zenith troposphere delays to be projected onto the slant direction. Okay, uh, then the outer sphere delay. So um, normally in the PPP processing, we use um, because we don't process a single frequency data, so uh, we can use the dual frequency combination to eliminate the first order of outer sphere delay. So I'm not going to have a lot of words to be uh, to be stated here for this kind of corrections, um, but you can uh, you can uh, uh, keep an eye on the correction on the correction of the of the higher or, higher order second order and the third order uh, atmosphere delay, which can do some uh, some benefit to your high precision positioning in some case. Okay, this is the the top sphere, uh, the atmosphere delay correction. So, um, so they, they we use the the atmosphere free combination, which is quite uh, which is used in the software as well. So we don't do any estimation on the atmosphere. So if you wanted to do some atmosphere modeling, this software is not a good choice for you because we have eliminated the uh, eliminated the atmosphere delays using the atmosphere free combination in the software already. All right, so uh, then we come to a very important part, the multipath effects. Uh, this kind of error is quite annoying because we don't have any models to mitigate them, or uh, you can't have any specific parameters to be estimated to mitigate multipath effects. Uh, this, this area is caused by the, um, by the reflection of the signal, of the electromagnetic signals released by the satellites. So whenever you have a ground antenna to be installed near some uh, near near some objects, uh, or or even if it's a free open sky, you can still have some signals to be reflected on the ground to be and then received by the antennas. So this kind of a mixture of the reflected signals and the direct signals can cause some uh, some correlation error within the within the within the genesis receiver tracking loop. So that can cause the uh, that correlation error uh, uh, will be uh, translated into the multipath errors. And now uh, the only way to mitigate the multipath is to have the, to have the, uh, for, for, take the GPS, for example, we can use the, uh, use the data from the previous day, uh, previous sidereal day to, uh, to, to have the, to have the, um, to have the uh, uh, multipath error to be computed along each, along each satellite path in the space, and then make that correction for the second day uh, because their position uh, because satellite position on two satellite days are the same relative to the ground stations. Okay, this is phase windup. Phase windup effects are specific to satellite antennas, and uh, um, uh, uh, this is this kind of error is caused by the uh, relative motion between the satellite antenna and the receiver antenna. Because the satellites are uh, flying around the uh, the globe from the uh, around the Earth, so their relative position. Towards the ground antenna at a specific station, uh, uh, is change is changing constantly. 
So this kind of uh, this kind of relative relative motion cause the uh, cause the uh, the the circular uh, circularly polarized uh, the right hand the right hand uh, right hand polarized uh, polarized the waves of the genus antenna to have some additional error, and this error can be up to one cycle, and uh, we have to think about it in the genus's uh, undifferentiated processing, and this error can be mitigated in the in the double difference state processing if you if the baseline between the two stations are too are short enough. Although, uh, okay, and finally we come to we come to the uh, the errors related to the receiver. Uh, so we don't have a lot of errors to be uh, to be directly related to the receiver. Uh, the solid earth tide and ocean tide is not is actually not uh, related to the receiver, but because of the uh, the motion of the ground caused by by the attraction of the moon uh, from the moon as well as attraction from the sun. And ocean tidal loading is caused by the uh, by the by the water redistribution, especially the ocean oceanic water redistribution caused by the moon. So these two kind of uh, tidal component can cause the uh, static static station position to be to be changed within the day. So if you want to calculate the uh, calculate the static position for a station per day, you have to make this correction uh, for the uh, caused by the solidless tides as well as the Ocean ties and pole ties, but actually, these three kind of corrections are not uh, directly related to re uh, related to the receivers. And then we have the receiver antenna as well. So they have uh, the phase send offset and the phase send uh, variation error, and these two kind of errors can be uh, can be larger than the errors for the uh, from the satellites. So uh, and we have to use. Um, uh, use the corrections provided by the antenna manufacturer. Uh, so in this case, we can uh, have the uh, have the position of the station to be calculated at uh, the phase center rather than uh, uh, rather than any other point which cannot be uh, be uh, be uh, be measured by the uh, electromagnetic waves uh, directly from the satellites. Okay, uh, so this is the receiver antenna correction. So, uh, so here I'm uh, I'm not going to have a lot of detailed information to be provided for the receiver antenna, but you should know that in, a, in your Runex data, we have you have the uh, the height uh, the height correction of your antenna. Uh, this kind of information is in the Runex in the head of the Runex file, and uh, we you also have the uh, antenna phase center offsets. Uh, which is contained in the uh, in the IGS antex file. So these two kind of corrections are quite different. The uh, so from the bottom right bottom right panel, you can see uh, the antenna height, which is which is which is plotted in blue, uh, shows the shows the distance between your search box and the antenna reference point. And your antenna phase center offset is actually the diff distance between your phase center and the antenna reference point. So whenever you wanted to make a precise correction for the antenna effects, you have to combine the antenna offset with the antenna height. And these two corrections are actually read uh, by the software automatically. So if you have some errors in your vertical components, you can go to your Renix head to see whether the antenna height is correct or not. All right, so uh, this is the for the introduction for the solid earth tide and the pole tide. So uh, I'm not going to to have a detailed introdu introduction on this uh, because uh, uh, they are not uh, directly related to the uh, the uh, the genus data themselves. They are more related to the uh, the earth uh, the, the 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 change of the shape of the earth uh, caused by the attraction from the sun from the third bodies. Uh, if you have a you have if you have a you wanted to to make some positioning uh, on uh, for a, for a, for a, a ship in the ocean for a platform in the ocean, so for example in this case you you still have to make the correction for the solid uh, solid earth tides because the seafloor uh, is uh, supporting the oceanic water, but we don't need to make any correction for the ocean tidal loading because. Um, because your platform is on the ocean rather than along the coastal areas of the ocean. 
So you have to uh, uh, to to make this dis uh, make uh, you can make make clear this discrimination in the processing, and we have provided this uh, provided this option for you to decide whether uh, this uh, this kind of uh, type of component correction should be taken into account or not. All right, this is the ocean container loading. Okay, as we have talked about, so uh, this can only uh, can be only applicable in the uh, in the coastal areas. So uh, we have a large uh, some uh, some large correction. It's partially close to some uh, some big oceans, and in inland areas, uh, which is uh, which are far away from the coastal areas, you actually no need to take it, uh, take this kind of correction into account. So so then when you have a when you have a ship or or platform located in the center of the ocean, you don't need to take take the ocean tidal loading into account. So if you, if you wanted to make a position, uh, position positioning, if you wanted to position a, an aircraft, then you don't need to do any correction on the solid earth tides or the ocean tidal loading because your platform is not connected to the ground. So then the solid earth tides uh, uh, is not going to affect your position. Okay, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this is all I have, and uh, uh, and uh, and I want to so before before we have a break, so I want just want to know whether you have any question on the on the basic knowledge of the of the GNSS. So, um, uh, Melissa, I I don't know whether they can uh, they can speak directly or they can just uh, type something some questions in the chat box. Uh, they can raise their hand, and we can call on okay. them. Um, or we can have them uh, put them in the questions in the uh, Q and A. Okay. Okay. So if you have any question, you can raise your hand. Uh, I can let me see anybody here. I have seen one question here. Calibration and correction. Okay, this is a question about the uh, the difference between the calibration and the correction. Uh, so I may I may use uh, these two words um, from time to time, and uh, from my understanding, they have no difference. So when you use a model, use a physical model like the top sphere delay, you use the Sustamoli model to Make some a priori correction for the uh, for the for the troposphere delays. You can say we uh, we use the model to calibrate the genesis data, and you can also say we use the Sustamoli model uh, to correct um, to make a correction on the data. So um, the calibration and the correction uh, don't have any difference in my case. So I just use them. Uh, in a mixed way, in a, in a, in a, in a mixed manner. So, yeah. There is a question in the chat too. It says for RTK applications, some references indicate that it is necessary to use Kalman filter. Um, the common uh, the Kal uh, the Kalman filter is not so uh, directly related to RTK or PPP. Um, it's some kind of algorithm to process the data epic, uh, in real time from epic to epic. So whenever you, uh, uh, in, in RTK uh, positioning mode, you have to use a, a base station and to, uh, to provide the correction data. And then you can use the, uh, you can use the, uh, you can use, your robot station can receive this, cor uh, this correction data or calibration data uh, in the Kalman filter. Uh, to to have your precise position to be calculated. In precise point position in PPP, you can also use the Kalman filter, uh, even if you don't receive any correction data from the base station, but the US receiving the, receiving the correction data from uh, from the IGS, for, for example, for real-time data streams, you have to receive the data streams in real time uh, for the satellite orbits and clocks. So this kind of correction data uh, are also uh, are also inject uh, uh, ingested into your Kalman filter to make the make your precise positions to be estimated. I don't know whether I got you. So uh, anyway, this is my understanding for the for your question.
Okay. Okay, uh, I think if you don't have any further question, we can have a break, have a short break about uh, maybe five to 10 minutes, and then we'll come back in, uh, for about five minutes, we can come back in, in uh, 10, 20, uh, in five minutes, in 18. So then we can uh, talk about the, the installation and uh, of the software, as well as some basic, uh, basic operation of the software how to, uh, on how to process uh, the so, so data in some basic process modes. All right, so uh, see you in five minutes. Yeah, I think I think we can we can uh, start now. Ji Han, could you? Uh, yeah, we, I, uh, we can see your screen. So could you uh, start the introduction of the software? Oh, I'm here. I can start uh, the instruction of the software right now. So okay, uh, could you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. Uh, before we come to the software, let's uh, introduce myself again. And Lin Ji Han from the Zhuang SS Research Center of Wuhan University, and I'm currently be responsible for maintaining and developing the software called PVVAR. As you all know, it's a Software that performs precise point positioning with ambiguity resolution using Zhuang SS data. Uh, uh, since we have introduced uh, uh, this course last year, uh, but we have just uh, got a lot of feedback from our users, both about how to use this software, the bug reports, and some complaints that the last year's course is too complex and obscure to be understood. So we have tried to improve a lot during this year. We have upgraded our software and fixed the bugs. Uh, also, I have tried to improve, improve my oral English. I hope you will find it more helpful and enjoyable. Oh, anyway, let's go to uh, the software. Uh, I think most of, uh, of you may uh, wonder what is this software used for and why did you choose this software? We know there are many high position so positioning software as well, such as uh, Bernice, uh, Gypsy, and uh, Article Lib. But we believe that the PVVAR has some unique features that make it stand out from the crowd. First, we guarantee to open source our software based on GNU3 license, so anyone can read, modify, uh, and transplant our codes and our algorithms into other platforms. Uh, and it's also easier to install this software without any other libraries. Uh, second, uh, Pad PVVAR can handle undifferenced uh, ambiguity resolution for uh, multi gen SS constellations, and it was probably the first open source software that had this uh, capability in 2019. It's quite useful to achieve hypersension of millimeter to centimeter level to support a wide range of earth science research and applications, such as analysis for an earthquake event, a giant SS network, troposphere monitoring, and so on. And the most important thing is, uh, we equip this software with the rapid product service from Wuhan University to support routine PPP AR, uh, and that has only a latency of about just one day, so you can process your data as fast as possible. Here is a list of the capabilities of our software for you to check out in more detail. For example, we support ambiguity resolution for GPS, Galileo, and uh, BDS satellites, but not for uh, Galileo, uh, sorry, not for Ganonas because of its frequency division modulation. Uh, and the sampling rate of observations can go up to 50 Hertz, which is enough to perform frequency decomposition for most climatic stations for both earthquake and uh, geophysics analysis. Uh, we can also process continuous observations from at least two minutes to up to 32 days. And to support automatic processing with, uh, with both timeliness and uh, reliable quality, we apply default rapid products from Wuhan University since uh, 2020 and uh, address combination products before then. 
uh, but we also support GNSS products from other analysis centers of IGS as well, as long as they follow the conventions and formats of IGS. Other products such as Troposphere and the Ionosphere products can be used to further correct atmosphere errors. This includes the global Ionosphere map from code and the Vienna mapping function from TOVM. Uh, as for general precession, several centimeters of standard deviation can be achieved for most common observations, and a few millimeters of precession errors can be obtained for observations in good quality and processed in static mode. Mm. And next, let me show you the command line interface of Pied PVP AR, which uses a set of options and uh, parameters to customize your processing strategies. If you don't set any, set any option, our PTPC script can fill the option automatically for you, so you can just use it more handily. When you do not set any arguments, as shown here, we, you will see the help message with all the usage of the uh, of our configuration options. We, mm, these options can cover most of the configurations you may would like to set. Therefore, you can mm, say goodbye to the perplexing configuration file as we in introduced last year. Also, the CLI version can work with other commands such as nested uh, loops to process large uh, amount of data sequentially or parallelly. Then we go to the uh, graphical user interface, the GOI. Uh, before we um, go to, into the details of it, we want to remind our users that in the future, the latest features and the routine maintenance uh, may be only available on our CLI version, including the upcoming new version of Python PPP AR we plan to release soon. Uh, which may be a bad news for some users who uh, would only like to use the GOI. Uh, we know the GOI version is more welcomed because it, uh, it is more simple and more easy to uh, use. It uh, has integrated some uh, uh, visual visualization engine to plot the result files, mm, and uh, some of them are uh, ju just beautiful. Uh, basically, interaction from the command line is replaced by option op uh, com components here, and a number of um, join engines are available here. And uh, so, but however, some features are limited due to the memory constraints in Windows and uh, Mac OS, such as uh, multi-day processing and the uh, handling of ultra-high frequency data with a uh, sampling rate higher than one hertz. Uh, then I'd like to introduce the result files, uh, which contains the uh, information for your further research and a uh, possible problem diagnosis. Generally, you can expect seven to nine result files for a uh, normal processing. There are prefixed with an abbreviation of three characters uh, as shown here and uh, suffixed with the processing date and the station name. The M file and the CST file contain information about ambiguity resolution, such as the number of resolved ambiguities and their values. The log file contains the health diagnosis of the Renex observation file, such as how to delineate observation arcs for ambiguities, the reasons why they are truncated or deleted due to some uh, other factors, such as circle slips, outliers, or low elevations. And the Kim file and the post file are the most important for most users as they contain the coordinates and we will explain them in more detail in next class. The other files may be useful in specific research fields such as the RCQ file for clock analysis, the REST file for multi-pace 
analysis and the ZTD and the HTG file for troposphere analysis. Mm, okay, uh, then we enter the next session. It's about the origin, history, and the current state of applied PPPAR. Uh, uh, as you may know, the, uh, the name of our research group, HIDE, stands for Positioning Research to Image and Decipher the Earth, which you can see when you finish installing the software. And following this philosophy, we designed this software not to perform high precision precision owning, but also to support various geoscientific applications. Before we released this software, the lack of routing public product service and the available software support for ambiguity resolution in PPAR had been a major obstacle for the development uh, of this technology despite its huge potential. Uh, so, as uh, at the 2018 address workshop, we announced our plan to produce open source software and accompanying services dedicated to PVPAR. And the first version of our software is available on GitHub in 2019. Although it only supported GPS constellations uh, at that time, we performed thorough and extensive testing using data from over 500 HES stations throughout 2018 to validate its accuracy of millimeters to centimeter level. Uh, you can still find this paper in GPS Solutions. Then in 2021, we released the second generation of the software, which is supported by major constellations from GPS to Beidou and uh, QTSS, and fully adopts the latest address format exchange conventions, such as the Running 3 code and the uh, fate biases in bias next format and the satellite attitude quaternions in OPEX format. Mm. Then in the last year, 2022, uh, we introduced the version 2.2, which brought some revolutionary innovations in the way we interacted with the software. Even though the functionality didn't change much, mm, I would like to say it just became easier to use and smarter to process. The use of CLI was redesigned into current version and uh, uh, we first released our GLI uh, for uh, Windows users. Um, and meanwhile, based on the needs expressed by some users, we have also added some new features such as multi-day processing. Okay, now um, we, I will address one of the biggest concerns of the participants in this class, that is um, what new in PPVAR in 2023. Uh, but it's a a bit disappointing to tell you that our third generation version with significant improvements has still not been released because our internal product services are still under testing. However, during the last year of main, ma maintenance, we have also fixed many user feedback issues. Now, quite PPVAR is definitely more robust and compatible than last year. At the same time, with the a uh, successful completion of the third reprocessing campaign uh, address. We replaced the pre-2020 product service from code with combination products with address uh, repository, which extends the support period for the PPAR service to the year 20, uh, to the year 2000. And it's pretty early, uh, in June SS, uh, Study. In addition, new standards adopted by address in the last year, such as the address uh, index bar, have been updated into the software promptly. Uh, so we welcome and encourage everyone to keep track of the latest updates to our repositories on GitHub 
and feel free to contact us by email or by submitting an issue. Uh, so we anticipated that our new generation of Pi PAR may be released by the end of this year, and I just can't wait to introduce you to some of its new features. And first and foremost, it will Im implement the concept and functionality of all frequency PPPAR, which means you can fix ambiguities on any combination of two frequencies of your choice. In our internal test results, the features uh, works quite well as it can achieve similar fixing rates and the positioning accuracy as the existing baseline frequency combinations. And at the same time, we also support precise orbit determination and uh, ambiguity resolution for low Earth orbit satellites. And it may be even extended to other spacecraft as well. Uh, for existing parameters such as positions, clocks, and uh, troposphere uh, parameters, we also offer additional estimation models for some professional users. Mm, it just uh, does sound exciting, right? Uh, but now let's uh, go back to our current version and I will show you with a couple of examples about how to get started with this software, how to process your first observation file. Uh, and don't worry, it's all very simple. Let's start by just by listing some of the essential exec executable programs that you need to have. Mm, and don't be fear if you are not familiar with Linux, as some of these are either tools that come with the system during installation or are part of uh, most common general collections. The only exceptions are Gfortune, the Fortune compiler, and the WebGet, the download tool, which you may need to check and install if you uh, don't have them already. Uh, and uh, uh, all these are for COI users. Uh, GOI users don't have to worry about uh, that at all since our package have all the dependency for you. So you can just uh, install your GOI and go. Uh, but if you are a COI uh, user, you may mm, indeed need to uh, check this, uh, these programs. And next, let's look, uh, take a look at the structure of the software package. As you can see on uh, our GitHub home, home page, most of the folders have self-explanatory names. And I will just remind you that uh, uh, our scripts are written uh, in Bash and uh, Python. And the source code is mostly functioned with a bit of C. Uh, if you want to read them to uh, understand some algorithm, you would be help. It would be helpful to have some background in these programming languages. Oh, so we uh, come to here. The installation process. It is pretty uh, straightforward, but I have written some tips here to avoid some uh, uh, common pitfalls. First of all, uh, it's a good practice to install the software under your home or ETC partition, not under the root partition. Otherwise, the bin directory of our software, which contains the executable binary files, may not be created properly. And second, you need to make the install script executable Otherwise, you will get an error saying that you don't have this permission. Uh, also, you may need to have the compiler tools that I mentioned earlier. Uh, Gfortune and the make, you can check it while mm, these two commands. And uh, if you don't have any of these issues, just uh, uh, run this command and wait uh, for about 10 seconds. Then uh, you uh, will succeed uh, the installation process. Uh, so here is a video demo where we first check. Mm, I will show you. 
uh, we first check the existence of the GeForce with uh, version as uh, its, com uh, its parameter. Normally, this passage message shown in the video will appear after you input these commands. And then we found the software package. We unzip it. Then we go into the package. Found uh, the uh, script and uh, give it executable permissions using the change mode command. Then the installation script is invoked, followed by a process of about 10 seconds. After which the PyLab icon will be displayed. And then there is an option that asks if you want to test the example data. We strongly recommend you uh, for the first installation and you can type Y to begin process uh, the testing process. Uh, okay, we just uh, stop here. And then next, let me show you how to choose a uh, position mode. In the current version of our software, there are three positioning modes, kinematic, static, and uh, uh, fixed. The command line option for the mode is M, and the parameter for the option is uh, one of the letters K, S, and uh, uh, or F. In the result file, the kinematic mode will produce a kin file, while the other two modes will produce a post file. If you don't specify any position mode, the program will use kinematic mode by default. Uh, uh, moreover, uh, I need to remind you in the fixed mode, the program will, uh, will download the daily address combination called ordinate solution from the server as a uh, reference, namely the SSC file. But if your station is not an address station, you may need to set the initial coordinates manually in you know, uh, uh, a bit more complicated way, uh, and you can refer to our manual to fund, uh, fund this process. Okay, uh, this is the video demo. Uh, we go to the example directory where we put three observation files here. We just uh, uh, possess one of them. Uh, 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 not, notice the input. Uh, p 3 hyphen m k uh, stands for kinematic and the name of the observation file as the last uh, parameter. And first, the programs display uh, your basic setup, such as the possession time, the possessing uh, interval, possession mode, station name, and uh, et cetera. Then it will download the files we need uh, from the server the broadcast uh, file and the precise products. Uh, then it goes through the normal processing flow and entering the data cleaning process. Uh, we can see some satellite names and the numbers which show the average residuals in millimeters of their uh, of their corresponding phase observations. And uh, after showing some information of this uh, ambiguity resolution, uh, the program will finish its, mm, its running quickly. Then we open the result files named after year and year of day. And we can find the Kim file that we want. Okay, the next part. Uh, 
Uh, let's see how uh, we can choose restrain RSS constellation to use for our data processing. It may be useful if you want to compare how different constellations affect our position accuracy, or if we want to avoid using constellations that have some uh, problems. To do this, we use the SIS option and give it some letters that standards for the constellation we want to include. One letter or a combination of them, depending on your needs. Uh, and you can check out this table to find what constellation this code stands for. Uh, one thing to note is that Beidou has two generations of satellite, satellites, and they are not exactly uh, are completely compatible with each other. They have different office types and signals as we have introduced just now. Uh, and so they are treated as two separate constellations. To distinguish them, we use a number uh, instead of a letter, uh, two and three, for example. Uh, and next is another video demo. Here, I show you how to process this data using two options I have introduced. Uh, setting the position mode to static and uh, choosing only GPS data. Uh, this observation file contains a whole day of observations, so it may take some time uh, longer to finish processing. Uh, we just wait and see. Uh, and as you can see, it shows us the processing states of each satellite. Uh, you may pay attention to the G09, uh, this satellite, which has a huge drop in residuals from 41 to 8 uh, after the first iteration. This means we are successfully removing the outlier from its, soft, from its observations. And uh, mm, uh, that's the, uh, that makes sense uh, for this iteration uh, for several times. Uh, okay, now we finished. Mm, as I have said, uh, we entered the uh, directory and uh, we can find the post fire for a static processing, uh, but not a Kim fire. Uh, okay, then we came to the last example today. We'll learn how to process data uh, from multi days continuously. This is a bit different from the Euro setup since uh, our GNSS data files and products are normally organized uh, day by day. But what if we want to process more than one day of data? Uh, we can do that by using the S and then E options, S uh, for the start and E for the end. This option let us specify the processing period. Uh, we uh, we need to put all the data files in the same folder and enter the name of the first one after processing the uh, first file. The program will automatically look for the next file in the folder until it reaches the end time uh, we set. However, uh, there is one thing that we need to be careful about is the names of our data files. The program can only bound the next file if it follows the Linux standard convention for naming uh, for naming files, in which the time tag uh, in the naming will help the program to know which file to be processed next. Both short and long naming are okay as long as you keep them consistent. Uh, otherwise, the program can not identify the next file after processing the first one you input. Mm. Uh, so this is uh, a 
video demo for this. Uh, but we just not input the date. Uh, we also time tag after the date as well. Uh, by this way, you can specify your position period more precisely. Mm, also, uh, choose G GPS data only and input the first observation file. Okay, we stop here. Uh, the first message show, shows the time range that the program recognized mm, and you can make sure if it matches what you want. Mm. Uh, it just takes a long time to people set this uh, data across to this. Then the iteration process, just like before, uh, you may notice that the residuals don't change much from the last video, uh, both uh, uh, one, digit, one digit for them. Uh, however, I want to warn you that uh, although we process the data across two days continuously, the products that we used for processing are not continuous across the, their processing batteries. Uh, so there is the day boundary discontinuity at midnight for the GNSS products we used. This can affect the continuity of parameters in our result files as well, uh, such as the positions and the receiver clocks. And that is one reason why multi-day processing does not uh, improve the accuracy very much. Uh, but our lab is uh, working on funding a uh, solution for this problem now. Okay, when the process is done, you will find your uh, result files in a folder that has the start date and the end date in its name. Uh, but the timestamp of each result file you only have the first day of process. Uh, it is uh, 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 like a role of our uh, program. Oh, um, okay, we enter the next session. Uh, we are going to learn about, uh, in this section, we are going to learn about the processing flow of private PPPAR. We have already talked about this topic last year, uh, and it does not change much. So this year, I will try to make it uh, even simpler. Uh, there are four steps. First, we prepare the initial coordinate and the product. And the second, we process the observation to remove the outliers. And the third, we estimate the parameters and the iteratively clean the data, as we just see. Uh, and fourth, we resolve the ambiguities and uh, constraint them to improve our processing accuracy. Uh, we will go through each step in uh, moderate detail and see what kind of data we need, how we process them, and uh, what kind of result we will get. Uh, so after you type the PTP3 command, the program will check and uh, interpret the options that you will give it. And then it will create a working directory for your process. Uh, the working directory has the name that follows the format of year and day of year, uh, 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 as that in the video demo. In, but inside the year direct directory, there is another directory called the Product, uh, which contains the process product, the products for further processing. Uh, the page to the product directory can be uh, customized in the configuration file if you really need to uh, modify that. 
but uh, uh, in our most common uses, uh, uh, th this step is just not necessary. And you can use your default uh, setup uh, without any problems. Uh, then the next uh, the program will download the broadcast navigation file and the PPAR product automatically. Um, uh, about this, uh, what these products mean and how they uh, uh, they function, uh, we will intro uh, introduce this in the next class. Uh, but uh, we just need the place where we get these files, uh, so you can download them manually. And uh, it may be useful if you don't have the internet access in your computer. You just uh, you can put the uh, download the files by yourself and uh, put them into the uh, into this uh, in, into this folder. Uh, then before we. Uh, start the parameter estimation. We need to run two programs, SPP and the SP3 or the SPP, uh, stands for stand point positioning. It's, a uh, uh, simple processing, uh, with navigation files to get the initial coordinates as well as the time range of the observations. Uh, it's all the basic uh, prerequisite, uh, information for, uh, further processing. And the SP3 all program converts the SP3 files into our own of files. And it inter, interpolates the office to match our processing rate and transforms them into, uh, the inertial coordinate system. This makes it easier and faster to calculate the corrections that we need for our parameter estimations. Then the next part is the data preprocessing with the TEDIT program, which help us clean up our data and remove the bad operations that might affect our results. The TEDIT is named after the Turbo Edit algorithm originated from the Gypsy software. This algorithm is commonly used in the health diagnosis and quality control and had uh, been modified uh, for years uh, into uh, our current form. It identifies the outliers, detects, and uh, but not correct circle slips uh, and finds the Clock trumps or other anomalies that interrupt our face observations. It also identifies and, and the labels continuous arcs of face observations that we can use for ambiguity resolution. And to do this, the TEDIT program needs at least two minutes of continuous observations as your input. After that, the TEDIT program will write a log file that contains all the information about our observations. A continuous arc of phase observation will have the uh, ambiguity parameter in our least square estimation, and uh, the time range of them are listed in our log file. Uh, namely the Renex health uh, diagnosis. Uh, along, uh, and other bad observations which are deleted will be labeled with DEL here and some reasons are denoted. And, and in the header, in the header, we also listed the number of ambiguity parameters and uh, 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 observations that are available or uh, have been removed, so you can have a general concept uh, about the observation quality of your Linux file. Uh, then now we have reached the most important part of our process, the LSQL program. 
uh, it does the least square estimation, which is a mathematical method to find the best solution for our parameters. And the parameters uh, are, are uh, is comprising of phase ambiguities, the coordinates, the receiver clocks for each constellation, and the Zenith travel sphere delay uh, shop. Uh, can be shortened as ZTD. Also, the horizontal tropospheric gradient, uh, 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 HTG, namely. Uh, the programs use all the files we have prepared so far, the observation file, uh, the products, the table files, and the initial products from the SPP, and the uh, log file from the TEDIT. This file contains all the information and the corrections that we need uh, for our estimation. You might have, uh, but you might have noticed that uh, there is no parameter for the ionosphere delay in our estimation. This is because we use linear ionosphere combination to eliminate this delay from our observations. Oh, uh, <clears throat> I understand that formulas can be quite boring and confusing, so I will not try to extend the idea uh, uh, in very much detail. I will try to explain that in a simple way. I feel linear combination takes advantage of the fact that GNSS signals propagate in a dispersive medium where the delay is inversely proportional to the square of the frequency. So we can just design a special linear combination of these observations on two frequency to eliminate this effect, uh, which is called the, just called the ionosphere-free combination. Uh, so it requires that we have dual frequency observations for each satellite, both cold and uh, phase, uh, so, and therefore, uh, our software can only process data that have these observations. Uh, and to speed up the least square estimation with a huge amount of data involved, uh, we know in kinematic uh, uh, mode, uh, each epoch we have uh, three uh, Coordinate parameters and in, also in ST, uh, in the stochastic uh, work uh, estimation model for travel sphere and uh, uh, clock parameters as well. So the total amount of observation and the parameters may be uh, quite large. So to uh, uh, reduce the calculation of the adjustment, we use a technique uh, called parameter eliminate an elimination, which was developed by Professor uh, uh, Gamaro. Uh, I, but I want to bore you with the details of how this technique works, but tell you what it uh, affects. It keeps the co uh, covariance information for only a few parameters that we care about, such as the static coordinates and the uh, ambiguities. Uh, for the other parameters, uh, their covariance information uh, was, disc was discussed, uh, uh, such as the kinematic coordinate clocks and the troposphere we just mentioned. And, and another thing to not note there is to, there is no filtering process such as uh, the common filtration in our estimation because we possess all the uh, observations at one batch and uh, in one uh, estimation system. Then the next step is the data cleaning. We need to clean up our data some more to get a more precise estimation. Uh, we, and we do this with our RATIC program, which stands for uh, residual diagnosis. 
The program looks at the residual bias that the article, uh, uh, the article program produced and finds the outliers and cycle slips that might have been missed by the tested program. Then update the log bar with these new, fun new findings. To get the best quality for uh, our float solution, we need to repeat the loop of LSQ and Reddit at least three times each time. Uh, we will use the updated log bar and, uh, uh, to filter out the bad observations and uh, keep only the good ones. Uh, we will stop when there are no more observations are removed and no more ambiguities are inserted. And this means that we have reached a stable and reliable solution. Uh, this is the uh, output that uh, you will see after each ready run, as we mm, just see in the video demo. Uh, the ready program takes two arguments as input, uh, the threshold to identify a circle slip, cycle slip, and a short ambiguity. Uh, these two values are in units of millimeters and uh, epoch numbers, uh, respectively. Uh, and the jump threshold for the circle slips will gradually reduce from four, uh, 400 millimeters to 50. So uh, this is used to avoid removing too many observations at once. Uh, and the, uh, there is the output also show, uh, show you that uh, the RMS phase residuals for each satellite. The output will show some uh, stati statistics about how many observations were removed and how many ambiguities were inserted by the Reddit program. Uh, and this is the final output from the Reddit program. You can see that the threshold value is 50 millimeters and there are just no uh, more changes in the observations or the ambiguities. The IMS residuals are also much lower than uh, we see before. Most of them are around 10 millimeters, which is very good. Uh, and the highest one is, um, uh, is the R11, uh, uh, 24 millimeters. This is still acceptable, so not ideal. Uh, now we, uh, we have refined our float solution, uh, and we can move on the next step, fixing the float ambiguities to integer values. This will improve our accuracy even more. To, and to do this, we use the ASIC program, which stands for ambiguity, uh, resolution. This program reads the ambiguities from the M file and uh, that the LSQ programs produced and fix them into integers and write them into the CIT files, which means the constraints that we will use to improve our estimation. But we know that to fix the ambiguities in, in, in single, uh, in point positioning, phase bias products must be used to correct the unknown single delay for each satellite. As we uh, have introduced in the uh, last course. Oh, uh, this is a basic flow chart shows you how to how we fix the ambiguity into integers. Uh, the first step is to correct them with uh, the products we just talked about before. Then we use the linear uh, combination and uh, to remove the uh, I underscore delay, uh, but as the, uh, I underscore linear combination, uh, has a very short, uh, wavelength of, uh, it may be, uh, and it may be very noisy because, uh, we have just combined, uh, two kind of observations. Uh, so it is quite hard to be fixed. Uh, so we will turn to help of the MW combination. Uh, we call them uh, Melbourne 
wood banner combination. It have a much la larger uh, wavelengths, so it is easier to fix. Uh, so when we um, use this combination to get the uh, and fix the so called wide lane uh, ambiguities, uh, because of their wider wavelengths, uh, uh, we can uh, fix our narrow lane ambiguities uh, in a row. Uh, and this is just the basic principles of the two-step fixing modes. Uh, we also apply the satellite to satellite difference to remove the receiver bias that that will equally affect all the observations. <clears throat> and this is a picture shows you how the a and B bar, the amp bar stores the undifferenced ionosphere free and wide length ambiguities as well uh, as their start and the end times of continuous uh, observations. The IF ambiguities are, uh, are given in a wavelength of the LE uh, phase wavelength, which is the first uh, the L1 fa phase wavelength, which is the first phase observation. Uh, and the uh, WL ambiguities are given uh, in a wavelength of wide length uh, linear combination. Uh, we could note that these ambiguities are far from their nearest integers because of the uh, receiver phase bias involved. But uh, after the satellite to satellite uh, difference, the receiver biases can be eliminated and the ambiguities are resolved into integers in the CSD, in the, CSD the constraint bias. The left column is the wide length uh, ambigu integer ambiguities, and the right column is the uh, narrow length integer ambiguities. Also, the ASIC, the ASIC program will show you the statistics of the ambiguity fixing rates. You can see how many ambiguities of each type and the constellation were fixed into integer values. Uh, the fixing rates are the percentage of the fixed ambiguities out of the total ambiguities. But uh, for the narrow length ambiguity fixing rates, they are uh, relative to the fixed wide length ambiguities, uh, ML uh, slash WL, not the total ones. It is because then uh, we can only fix the narrow length ambiguities after fix, uh, fixing the wide length ambiguities. Mm, as we introduced before, uh, you don't need to uh, worry about uh, how to try, uh, choose to evaluate your uh, uh, quality of ambiguity resolution uh, very much. Uh, if you are not doing any specific research, uh, uh, I suggest uh, you to uh, just see the uh, the in the independent ambiguity fixing rate, uh, which is the uh, subset of all ambiguities that are independent from each other, uh, and uh, it is quite simple uh, to to look at, and uh, it is the uh, usually. Uh, we can have a, a percentage of higher than 90% of wide length ambiguity fixing rates and 80% uh, of narrow length ambiguity fixing rate. Uh, uh, the result we show here is uh, uh, can be called very good uh, despite the ambiguity fixing rates for uh, uh, BDS3. Uh, and uh, okay, congratulations. Uh, we have uh, uh, completed our first day's course, and I, I hope you have learned a lot and enjoyed it. Uh, now I have some assignments, but don't worry, they are not for grading or judging. It's just for you to practice and explore what you have learned. Uh, I will give you some hints and suggestions here, and uh, uh, the assembly answers will be given in the next course, uh, the day after tomorrow. Uh, uh, you should have uh, received a link to a shared board that has some example data that 
uh, used for the homework. And if you don't get them, uh, we'll send it to open you later again. Uh, of course, you are free to use uh, your own data if you want. It does not matter. Uh, uh, so the first task uh, is to compare the different positioning modes, uh, static, fixed, and kinematic. Uh, you can look at how they differ in terms of the position flow, the product required, the results obtained uh, using the uh, information I have introduced to you, uh, and uh, so on. Uh, one way to do this is to compare the result files from each mode and see uh, what changes between them. Uh, and I also suggest you to try to visualize the kinematic, kinematic coordinate series using our own utilities uh, of the PPPAR and some plotting scripts or compare our uh, static coordinate solution with the address Cinex solution as a reference. Uh, it may be downloaded with the, uh, when you use the uh, fixed positioning mode. Uh, and another task is um, a bit more challenging, but more scientific. It is to process a uh, different example data. In, uh, it is also in our shared folder. Uh, th this data re uh, recorded a seismic wave from the uh, 2022 Fukushima uh, earthquake. You can process this data in kinematic mode and convert the results uh, to a local reference frame using the uh, using the utility XYZ to ENU. Then you can plot the result files and try to uh, find the arrival time and the maximum displacement of the seismic wave. Uh, and all right, that's all for the homework. Now mm, we, we have some time for question and answer. Uh, uh, and thanks everyone for your attention. Uh, you just can ask me uh, the questions as uh, uh, the last the last course. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jihang. Uh, so, if any, uh, if anybody have any question, uh, we can. So, especially for some basic processing of the Genesis data, as well as some, if you are interested in the processing philosophy and uh, uh, and the data processing theory behind the Genesis uh, high precision Genesis, you can uh, you can also ask us. Uh, some details about the uh, about the software. Um, so okay, we got uh, the one question thing. Uh, open the question. I'm curious to know what the advantage of the software. The long line software. Um, so this is an interesting uh, an interesting question. So uh, you are, you are asking us to make a comparison between the between the Pride PPR software and other existing software packages i think um uh, uh all of the all of the software are uh have their advantages um that depends on whether you think this one a particular software fits your uh, fit your application sometimes you think this one uh, may better fit your needs and uh, you can you can use it uh freely and uh you have no problem to uh, to access all of it, all of its uh uh, functions, all these capabilities with your, uh, uh, with respect to your data, with respect to your special needs. So, um, uh, from our testing, I think all of the uh, science scientific software that can be accessed by the public uh, have a very similar precision uh, in terms of positions and the top speed delays. Uh, they have no, uh, no. Um, uh, significant differences. So you can just uh, try and make a comparison. And we have saw we have seen some uh, some some articles online uh, just a few months ago. A group of uh, a group from Mexico has done some comparison on the on the open source software and the software that can be accessed online. And you can see that kind of article to see how each software performs. Uh, 
uh, we can provide that, uh, that article as an attachment for, uh, to this uh, slides. Okay, the second question, can private combine daily solution to determine, uh, to determine of the last day solution? Um, uh, in the function, we, we, we don't have a, we don't have the, the software doesn't have the capability to, to estimate the velocities directly from the filter. Uh, we only in the climatic solution we have the uh, we we only do oh oh I think you combine daily solution to determine a velocity so you mean to do something like the uh, using the daily uh, daily coordinates to to estimate the uh, the tectonic rates or something uh, some kind of long term uh, long term velocity of the tectonic motions if this is the case I I think we we don't have this capability at the moment uh, we used to produce a uh, uh, produce a uh, uh, produce a daily solution format uh, that is compatible with the gamut software uh, and then use the PBO, PBO post, I think, PBO post uh, function of the gamut software to determine the velocity from, uh, from a daily, daily solution time series. Uh, but this function seems quite, uh, uh, quite um, um, it's not so, has not been included in the software so we have that, but uh, at the moment it's not uh, it's not included in the software packages. Um, so, so third question is uh, about the receiver and tenant phase calibration. What will the PVR do if such information is not found in the active database? So so if you don't have the antenna antenna phase center calibration information in the antex soft antex file, uh, which is provided by the IGS. Uh, the software will just assume zero antenna for the processing. That means all of the antenna phase center offsets and the and antenna phase variations will be set to zero, and uh, you will get a position estimate uh, with respect to your uh, phase center rather than the, uh, the, the the monument mark on the ground. Okay, the th uh, following one is thank for use for class information and monument processing. This daily value file. With the things and overlap at the beginning and then, uh, yes, you can. Even if you have a uh, some kind of uh, a thirty second time overlap at the, at the begin at the beginning at the end of the end of each day, um, uh, the the philosophy uh, the philosophy of the software software to read the uh, read the writing style is to uh, so read the read the data from the first day and then go to the second of, uh, go to the uh, go to the file for the second day. So uh, it will count the time. Uh, from epic to epic, so then uh, it will increase the time tag for the for the next epic, and then to find the uh, uh, find the relevant uh, relevant epic uh, uh, relevant epic of the data for the, from the next file. So even if there is some overlap, the overlapped epics will be ignored by the software. Okay, you're welcome. Um, so just now, Ji Hang talked about uh, talked about some assignments we have uh, for this uh, for the first day first day of course. Uh, so you can try that data uh, from the from the Google Drive, and we have uploaded all of the uh, all of the video demo, as well as the raw data into the into the uh, Google Drive, and you can see uh, whether you you can use this software to process data successfully, and you can check the results next time. Uh, you can make a comparison between your processing. And the processing we have, uh, we have provided in the, uh, we, we will provide in the next course. All right. So we have a we have, fun, we have a further question. I will not use uh, getting the following variables to reason for the resolve it. Um, this is a uh, this this error seems that uh, shows that you are using an old old version of the software. You should download the software. Uh, you should download the latest one. Uh, from the from the GitHub, so this is uh, uh, this is uh, this this error shows that we have not uh, adapted our software to the to an IGS twenty antex file. But now this this bug has been fixed, so you should go to the GitHub to to download the latest one, latest version. Uh, then the following question is: the, Is the software be used on Windows? Yes, yes, we have a we have a we have a version on Windows. As well as a version in in Mac in Mac OS, um, that uh, but that version the ver uh, the Windows version um, doesn't have the uh, complete uh, capability. I mean the full capability of processing Genesis data 
uh, I mean, the function, I mean, the capability of the of the Windows version is not complete as the version of the Linux version. Uh, this is because we have some limitation in uh, in doing uh, in, in managing the memory allocated by the Windows system, and uh, and some 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 functions on Windows is not uh, in Linux is not easily implemented in the system in Windows. For example, for the multi day processing. And uh, so this kind of processing, uh, we, we, we did this processing in Linux using some, some shell script, uh, but in Windows, uh, this function cannot be, can hardly be implemented. So uh, we just ignore this kind of, kind of capability in the Windows version. Uh, so you can use the Windows version, but the, but the capability of the Windows version is not as powerful as that of the Windows of the Linux version. All right. Okay. Okay, we have a chat box here. Okay, we got it. We got the software. So, right. Mm -hmm. So, if you have any question on uh, any suggestion on the on the improvement of this uh, of this course, you can send us email on uh, what do you would like to see and uh, what do you would like to hear. Um, we just got some lessons from the last two years of uh, training. And sometimes we want to show you how to uh, how to run the software. Uh, we we just open a open a terminal to show that. But sometimes it's hard for the train for the trainees to follow uh, follow your steps. So they may make them to be make them con confused. So this year we 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 just record some uh, record some demo to show the operation step by step. So I hope this can facilitate you to understand how to use the software. Uh, can we have the solution for four hours per 24 hours to six solutions? For example, or something with JavaScript and have them be a motion time in the demo. Uh, yeah, you can. You can. Uh, this is actually the function of the version version three. So just now we mentioned that the version three is um, is a start because uh, we have some problem for the product. Uh, we are going to use the all frequency phase bias product to enable uh, ambiguity resolution on any observable combination and any frequency of, uh, combination. So this is the most powerful version for PPPAR. So the problem is uh, we needed to prepare um, the all frequency phase biases rather than uh, rather than only L1 and L2. And uh, we did a lot of uh, comprehensive analysis on the on the products, but we still but this bug is still on the way, so uh, so we haven't finished that. So in that version, in that version three, we can estimate positions every five minutes, every ten minutes, every four hours, whatever time span you would like, and then you can output the position. Uh, for example, six solutions per day if you process the data every four hours uh, over uh, or over over the ten four over the daily data span. Uh, so this is the. This is actually the processing strategy I have used in my in some of my articles, especially for you to analyze just now, just as what do we have set for the oceanic tide analysis. So every four hours, every two hours, it's, uh, it's okay. So this uh, this is not, not uh, implemented in the version 2.2, but it's okay in the version three. So which is going to be released before the end of this year, hopefully, uh, the because the data, uh, the phase bias product analysis, uh, uh, has some problem at the moment. We are still doing our, uh, um, we need to still some more effort to uh, to improve the quality of the phase bias product, uh, uh, the the old frequency phase bias products. So lastly, we had a we had a we had a talk about uh, we are going to have the version three before the end of the last year. But finally, we uh, we, we 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 can. It's just because we have a. It's very complicated to uh, to make the product. Uh, stream, um, streamlined uh, from day to day. Uh, you can have some good products on some days, but sometimes it's just down. It's just because we uh, have some bugs in the program to uh, for the warbit determination for the uh, for the third frequency phase bias production uh, uh, generation. So all kinds of problems and an inc incompatibility of the S uh, of the X channel and the CQ channels of for the Galileo data for the Galileo data. Uh, so this uh, this is delayed for a year, and uh, and uh, and we hope we can uh, we can fix all of the bugs in the software. I, I mean, in the in the product generation software, 
uh, before the end of the year. Okay, uh, have you made a test with low cost receivers? Uh, we 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 did we did uh, we we used some uh, some data from the Mublox receivers to to test the to test the solution. I think it's okay if you have dual frequency data. Uh, you can you can safely use our software to do the processing with uh, low cost receivers. So uh, if you have dual frequency data, but but if you have a single frequency data. Uh, this is not okay for the software because software cannot process any single frequency observations and uh, don't use this software for uh, for some uh, for some data in very complicated environments such as urban canyons. So this software is not used for some vehicle navigation or some driverless vehicle test. It's just used for geophysical analysis. So. So we ask for some open sky environment for the observations. Uh, in term, the next question is, in terms of the precision, you use standard receiver and process register, how bad will the resolution will be after I use standard receiver? Uh, this kind of, uh, the precision depends on uh, the data span. So how long the data span, how long is the data span for you to process? Uh, for example, if you use 24, hour, 24 hours of data, you can achieve millimeter level precision uh, in the horizontal plane and about three to five centimeter, uh, millimeters for the vertical uh, for the vertical component. If you are proce processing kinematic data, that means you have a position estimate for every epoch. Then you can have you can achieve a position and precision of about uh, a few centimeters in the horizontal plane and a few and several centimeters for the vertical plane. And this kind of precision is just some kind of normal standards. If you have uh, some bad data, for example, you have a lot of cycle slips and wires, this precision can, can, can be worse than, than the precision that I have, uh, uh, we, we can regularly have. Uh, dual frequency view blocks receivers, have you used the Unicool communication receive example? Uh, I think so. We, uh, we process this kind of data from some Chinese uh, from Chinese uh, receivers, I think uh, they, if they can follow the standards of the Renex file as well as the naming convention of the Renex of the Renex data, uh, and it has the has the dual frequency uh, data required by the Pride PBR software, I think you can get very successful results using the software. Welcome. Uh, okay, uh, I think so. I think we have a. Uh, we have a very uh, successful uh, training class today, and I thank uh, thank uh, Melissa, thank the colleagues from Autoscope, and I thank all of the participants for your patience. And uh, we can uh, meet each other uh, in two days, and we have the uh, the second part of this course. Okay, see you guys. Uh, thank you, thank you, Melissa.